I really don't have time to do justice to this uh, message today. Uh, but I'm going to dive in, and if I just get through part of it, we'll finish up next week. Does that sound okay? All right, and some of you will have to come back for part two. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, we all know, I think, if you've been here over the past month or so, we've been in a series on transitioning. Transitioning is something in life that is inevitable. You can try to run from it, but it's going to come your way. It's going to touch your life at some point. Now, the backdrop that we've been using for most of these messages is, is the behold moment that John the Baptist had when Jesus came to the banks of the Jordan to be baptized. John was baptizing. He was at the height of his ministry. He was at the height of what he was called to do, what he was prophesied over to do, and he was in the fulfillment of that. And in that moment, the preparing of the way of the Lord, okay, pointing, bringing people back to the knowledge of Messiah and pointing to Messiah, the fulfillment of the law, the moment came, his transition moment, where Jesus stood on the banks of the Jordan and John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was pointing to Jesus. Jesus was the final Passover Lamb, okay? And he was right there before him. Now, in that moment, there had to be many things that he must have felt. You know, the elation, the fulfillment, oh my goodness, everything that I have been preparing for, everything that I have been preaching about, it's coming true, it's right here standing in front of me. But at the same time, there was a transitional moment. And that transitional moment after that, okay, because John was faithful, and again, this flies in the face, face of our Western theology sometimes, where did John end up? Prison. He ended up in prison in a dungeon, and he was sentenced to die. In fact, the death that he, that he faced was beheading. Now, I don't know about you, but I would begin to question things in those moments. But I will tell you, even when he was in that prison, Jesus encouraged him, okay? Jesus sent back word of the things that were happening just to encourage him. Because there was a moment of doubt in, his, in there that you can actually look at. His humanness showed forth. He wanted to know, are you really him? Transitions. They're difficult. And we've known that God is transitioning us in our lives. And even as a family of God here at Canton Assembly, from the prepare ye the way moment to the behold moment. The behold moment is that moment that it, that it, it literally means you don't want to miss this. You don't want to uh, miss the opportunity. It's right in front of us, friends. Jesus comes near. Don't miss those opportunities. The behold moment happened for many people last week. There was between seven and nine individuals that raised their hands last week and prayed for salvation right here in our services. Amen? Isn't that beautiful? And in those moments, that's the behold moment. What are you going to do when Jesus is face to face? Well, now is the next step. Now we have to take care. Now we have to tend and disciple and begin to live this journey out. And as we have discovered, it requires us to surrender ourselves and to fully just embrace what Christ is and who He is. Now we've looked at the life of worship. We understand that that is a reasonable response for us. We understand that there's the life of faith, right? Faith, you know, the, the thing that we can't always put an answer to, but there's that faith in our hearts. It's not about a, a, a doctrine or, or, or following some strict adherence to a set of rules. It's about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. Faith is a gift from God. We talked about living on mission. We talked about that every single one of us has skin in the game right? Every one of us has something to do. We have a race to run. Last week, we looked at living a life unveiled. And you know, I talked about that idea that we just come before God naked as we are, okay? And you know, and, I, and that doesn't mean that we're all going to come in here and disrobe, all right? That's not what we're talking about. 
The truth is, is that when we come naked before God, we just come as we are. We, we don't sit there and try to hide all these little things that we do. We don't have to put a mask on before God. You step into the light as he is light. And your life then is revealed. And it's okay. It's a safe place. I wish the church at times could, could go back and retra- retrace some things because we heaped a heavy load on people and we made them afraid to actually come into the light. We made them afraid to just be real and come to the Lord unveiled. But the scriptures called us to come to God unveiled. Unveiled is living in plain sight. Living unveiled is embracing transformational living and it's understanding this truth. You are fully known. All your junk, all your stuff is fully known. And you are fully accepted and embraced as you are. When we come and we repent and we ask God, repentance is simply changing the way that I think about things. It's admitting that maybe my thinking wasn't right. I need to repent and get things right with God. And I change my thinking and I turn to God in those moments. It's when I come to him with authenticity. And then today, the behold moment, okay? And I've already touched on this a a couple times already. Today is that behold moment is literally engaging in the race or the assignment that God has set out for me and for you to run. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn in the New Testament to the book of Hebrews in chapter 12. And it says this, reading from the NIV, it's on the screen there. I think they got New, New King James up there. You need, yeah, if you could put the NIV up, change, just change the version. There you go. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off. Everybody say, throw off. Throw off. Everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. Other versions say the author and the finisher of the faith. Okay, I like that. So every one of us, that includes you and me, every one of us has a race to run. You have a divine purpose that you were created with. Every one of us is God's handiwork or his masterpiece as the scriptures declare. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared for us to do. If you want to turn over to 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says this in verse 24, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. See, friends, when God calls your name, when you have that behold moment, all right, he has called you by name. He has said, you are mine. I don't know about you, but that brings great comfort to my soul. Quoting out of Isaiah there. That is the place that we are all called. We are called to surrender. It's a, it's a call that God has placed upon your life. And it's the place where you and I come and we say, God, I've been trying to do this all myself for too long. It's time that I give you the wheel and I let you direct my life. It's time to enter in. For me, that happened in around 1992, April time frame. I was up in a little assembly of God church up in Alpha, Illinois. There was a minister that actually came out of this church. Many of you know him as Reverend Black. He he was up there. He was an old fireball, man. This guy would get up there, and he would just preach hellfire and brimstone, and he would get all red-faced. I thought he was going to have a heart attack on the stage. But the truth is that he was up there, and God used him in my life. And I remember when he made the call 
And he said, there's somebody in this room, okay? And we didn't have a, a, a big gathering at the time, but I think it was a Sunday night, and, and we were all there together. And I could still remember, I was sitting over here, and he was making the call, and he just kept looking at me. And I'm like, why are you looking at me? And I put my head down. And every now and then, I bet he's still looking at me, and I'd look up, and he's still looking at me. And I knew in my heart, because my heart was just bursting over. There was a call of God on my life. And it was for something special and unique. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how it was going to all look. But I remember when I finally answered and I went to the altar, the place of sacrifice, and I laid down and relinquished my rights, and I said, Jesus, I am yours. I'm your currency, as some people will say. Spend me as you wish. I didn't know what I was signing up for, but I will tell you, that was my behold moment. That was one of them. And I beheld the Lord, and I knew that He had something special for me. I found a place then to serve. I got involved wherever I could. I wanted to serve. I wanted to do something different. I knew that I couldn't keep living the way that I was living. I couldn't keep just going to the bars and doing this and doing all the other things that were just taking me down. And as I did that, I learned about humility. I learned about not always getting your way. I watched people, even though their marriages weren't perfect, but I watched them actually stick to it through the tough times. I saw people parent their children, some good, some bad. I saw stewardship and priorities and real worship and not performance. I saw what it was to be a real one. And I still learn that every day of my life and my journey. You see, I saw examples all throughout these last 25, 30 years. What it was to live out your life of faith in Jesus, to actually step into the call. And trust me, I fumbled and I bumbled and I did all kinds of knuckle-headed things. But God, through all of that, He was refining me and sharpening me and making me a tool that He could use for His glory. I learned that when you fail, that you get back up. Amen. And I learned that sometimes... It's lonely, especially the deeper you go with Jesus. I will tell you that the closer you get to the cross, the smaller the crowd is. The closer you get to Jesus, the more intimate it is. But you need to understand that there's a lot that aren't willing to do the work that's needed to go there because... As I've mentioned already, the place of suffering is not a popular destination. But it has the greatest power. Amen. So 25 years later, I'm in a place and I'm trying to figure out direction for my life. And I heard this this week. It was by a Christian rap artist. It was on the YouVersion app and I can't remember his name right now, so I apologize, but I give him full credit for this. But he said this in it. He said, your occupation is what you're paid for. Your calling is what you're made for. So regardless of your occupation, we operate in our calling. You, under, you understand that? And it's beautiful when those two things intersect. When your occupation and your calling are able to intersect. But sometimes it doesn't, okay? It's beautiful when it does. But I'm going to serve God. I'm going to enter into my calling, whether I'm working at a plumbing shop, whether I'm working in a bank, whether I'm a teacher at a school, or whether I'm a pastor at a church, I'm going to enter into my calling, what God has called me to do. Pastors are not the only people who are called. That is a vocational title that I carry. If, if there's a true sense of who I am in Christ, I'm more of an evangelist. I'm, I'm more in that prophetic realm. That's really where I operate. Thank God. I, did, I don't take that for granted. I, it's Everything that I have is from Him. I don't possess anything. He possesses me. Hallelujah. Be careful of people who throw their gifts around like they're really something. Be careful of those people. I just, I just give you that as a word of caution. 
We must understand that kingdom timing and my timing is not always the same. Amen? Can anybody agree with that? (laughs) In Galatians 6 and 9, it says, Do not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest. Do some of you remember the story when Jesus was presented at the temple? Remember the old man, Simeon? He had been there for years and years and years, and God had given him a promise in his heart that he would see, okay, the fulfillment, the consummation of Messiah right in front of him, that he would actually behold this, and he would see this in his lifetime. He was getting to a place where he's like, Lord, you, you better uh, hurry up here, okay? Because I don't have many years left. Something tells me he was beyond that 72.5 years that Billy talked about last week. The truth is, is that there was the day, though, because he didn't become weary in doing good. He didn't leave his post. He stayed, operated, and believed in his calling by faith. And as he did, there was the day that Joseph and Mary brought baby Jesus to the temple, and all of a sudden, Simeon's heart erupted, okay? And he was able to literally hold and behold the glory of God in his hands, hallelujah. He saw that fulfillment right before him. He was able to prophetically make declarations over the child, along with Anna, the prophetess who was in the temple, He could have very easily succumbed to the pressure. Well, I guess it's just not going to happen. I guess I didn't hear God. I guess the promise isn't going to be fulfilled. Just like those people, a whole list of people in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that those individuals believed God and they lived their lives the promises that they had received, even though they hadn't received those promises, they lived their lives as though they had. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty powerful. I want to live my life, even though I don't always see the, 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 the things, that, the demands that I make of God, okay, to intervene on my behalf, or I don't see those things happen just right now. I want to be like an individual who goes through suffering and stays faithful to God. Oh, they might have some ups and downs. They might have some times of question. They might have some times of doubt. But I want to see them faithful to God. That's why I can say that I look up to my brother. Why? Because he stayed faithful and true to God. Not perfect by any means, but owned his stuff as he's gone through his journey. And then when the good times come, whoo. It's just a sweet spot. Amen? Amen. It's a sweet spot. Praise the Lord. Can we give God glory for that? Amen. So I want to say this to us today. Your race is your race to run. It's not anybody else's. Nobody else can run it for you. You were created with a purpose. You were created with destiny. If you turn over to the book of Acts... Chapter 20, in verse 24, it says this, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is, this is beautiful, my only aim is is to finish the race. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of what? Testifying to the good news of, the God, of God's grace. Friends, if there's anything, if we can get anything, you're not called to 152 different things to do in the church, okay? You're not called to just fill your tank up with just all kinds of mindless activity. I'm telling you what, the enemy will do that, and we're going to look at that next week and show you. But the goal of our lives as Christians is right here in this verse, is to finish the race that God has set out for us to run. Amen? All right, I'm going to close here. I'm going to go over to 2 Timothy 
Next week, we're going to have a little fun. I have a, we're going to look at the, we're going to go back to those verses in Hebrews, okay? And we'll have a little fun with that. It'll be good. I promise you. (laughs) In 2 Timothy, praise the Lord. Everybody okay today? God's so good to us. I love Jesus. I just love him. Pastor's got to find 2 Timothy. Chapter 4. These were the scriptures that God used to call me with. And as I was reading the verses that I was going to read, the Holy Spirit had me back up a little bit, and He reminded me of my calling. It says in verse 4, "...in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge." Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For there will be a time, a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and they will turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Let it go. Do what I've called you to do. Paul says this to young Timothy. And these words speak to you and I today, 2,000 plus years later. And he says this, He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, hallelujah, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. Church, do you long for His appearing? Do you long for the things of God? Do you long for His presence? Do you long to bask in His presence? Do you long to just sit in the shadow of His wings? Do you have enough opening in your life to allow Him in? Or are you so fragmented that you have no time for Him? Can we make an open door for Him? Can we say, Jesus, there's room in this inn. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Hallelujah. Paul was writing from a prison. He was anticipating his death soon. Many of his friends, many of his companions had completely abandoned him. And he was saying a fond farewell to young Timothy. Most say that this is Paul's last writing before his death. And he was doing this to Timothy. He was saying, Timothy, stand firm. Stand firm in your convictions. Honor my word. Honor the word of the Lord that's been given to you. Endure to the end. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but God has deposited 
that same message into every single one of our hearts. And he's calling you and I to stand firm and to endure to the end. I tell you, when we settle that in our spirits, it's a lot easier to walk. It's a lot easier to walk courageously and with confidence. It doesn't mean you need to go out and look for picking a fight with somebody. But you can rest confidently in assurance, with assurance that God has you, that He's your front guard, that He's your rear guard, that He surrounds you, hallelujah. That the hills around your life, if we could just see and have our spiritual eyes opened, they're filled with warring angels from heaven that God has dispatched on your behalf, hallelujah. Do we understand how much God believes in you and the message that he's placed inside of you? Do you understand how much he loves you and cares for you? Do you know that he will go to the ends of the earth for you? That he will turn the stones over? Even in the midst of your hardship, God will be faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good. Don't ever forget that. God is good. He loves you, and He is for you. He will never leave you, and He will never, ever forsake you. He can't violate His nature, friends. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus.